I'm Emma, um, part of Meta Support Unit. I'm a methods editor. And so I'm going to talk about uh, risk advice to common errors. Um, so things we usually see when we're looking at assessments. So the ones that I'm going to describe are uh, generally applied to the whole to the whole process. Um, and Rachel talked about the domains, but I'm going to talk about just general kind of common errors that happen. And um, so these are missing information in the protocol and um, empty description boxes in the tool, uh, authors overriding the algorithm with no justification and them assessing too many results. Um, I'll also note that I have been an author as well using this tool, so this could easily be a list of my common, er common errors, so there's no judgment at all from me. And so I thought, thought I'd firstly discuss the protocol um, and how it's quite common that authors can leave out uh, key information uh, which is used to describe the tool. So it's really important that um, the protocol includes a thorough description of the tool and it also details some of the decisions which should be made before undertaking the review. So here I've presented um, a couple of examples which have been anonymised um, and these are under the um, the section assessment of risk of bias and included studies and the methods. So as you can see, the first uh, section is really short and very vague. Um, the second, sec second example goes into a lot more detail. So you'd hope that might address um, some of the major considerations. But I'll come back to these examples again to see if they included everything after I've gone through some of the information which should be included in the protocol. So there are nine kind of items that the section assessment of risk of bias and included studies should include in the protocol. So we ideally would love the authors to reference the tool, um, ideally the paper in the BMJ, but also you can do the Cochrane Handbook, but it'd be good to do both. Um, as Rachel mentioned, that you need to decide on the effect of interest, so this should also be stated in the protocols, whether the authors are interested in effective assignment or effective adherence, and sometimes it can be both. Um, you also want to list the results that you're actually going to assess using the risk of bias 2 tool. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and there are different tools for the different um, crossover and cluster designers in RCTs. So it's important to mention them if you are going to include those types of RCTs. Um, and then with, with the first uh, risk of bias tool, you always stated who's going to be assessing the risk of bias, how many people are going to be doing it whether it's independently done or and in duplicate. Um, and then you also want to list the domains of the tool and um, describe the judgment options, which are different to the first tool. So it's high, some concerns are low, and also talk about how overall risk of bias is reached. Um, and that's using those signaling questions and the algorithm. And then also highlight what tool you're going to be using to do the assessment. So in most cases, that's the risk of bias to um, an Excel tool, which is available on the, um, on the website. And then we also like authors to talk about how they're going to present their risk of bias um, to judgments. So in the actual COC review itself, you only present the um, judgments per domain and overall. So all those answers to signaling questions aren't actually included in the actual COC review. So it's quite nice for those to be available to the reader as supplementary material. So that could also be uh, mentioned in the protocol. So if we look back at those examples that I gave you, um, see, obviously you can see with the first one that they haven't really addressed many of the items. Um, they've talked about um, doing the judgments independently in duplicate and they put a reference to the tool. Um, but yeah, they haven't mentioned the effect of interest, which is commonly left out by authors. They haven't detailed the tool really or talked about which results they're going to assess. And so therefore, this one um, has only managed to address two of the nine items, which is not surprising considering how short it is. But I'll also highlight another common thing that we do see, and it's this use of each study. So with this the risk of bias 2 tool, the assessments are actually per result, not per study. Um, so it's really important to try and get out of the habit of talking about risk of bias too as a study-based tool. Um, and yeah, it's taken me quite a long time to, to get out of that kind of mindset with it. So if we're looking at the uh, second example, so we'd hope that it addresses more of what we need in the protocol, but actually it doesn't really 
address that much more. Um, it has managed to reference it all, which is good. And um, I did double check, and that is the correct version of the handbook. But if you were to do a protocol now, you'd want to reference the latest version of the handbook, which is the 2022 version. Um, I think mainly criticism of the, the referencing is just where the actual reference is placed. So it's actually after the sentence, we resolve disagreements by discussion. And um, I think when I read that, it looks like Julian Higgins actually resolved the disagreements. Maybe he did, um, but I think it's probably unlikely. So yes, obviously you'd want to move that reference to the end of the first sentence, um, but we'll still give a, a tick to that point. Um, so then the other items it's managed to address um, is stating who will do the assessments and listing the, the domains and listing the judgment options. Um, so it did still score four out of nine, but obviously missed out some of the key points. So there's also some other sections where you'd want to talk about risk advice to. Um, in the data synthesis section, it's good to state whether your primary analysis will include all of the studies or whether, whether it'll just include ones that have been rated at low risk of bias. Um, and quite often, um, authors do subgroup or sensitivity analysis using risk of bias. So it's good to talk about that in the protocol and also talk about it in the grade um, section because risk of bias too obviously feeds into, into grade. Okay, so the next uh, common error that I'll talk about is these empty description boxes. Um, so if you're familiar with using the tool, uh, this is from the Excel tool that's available on the website. Um, and this is just an example that I made up, but obviously based on some of the ones that we do see. And um, so I do get, well, we do get quite a lot of requests from authors asking for us to look at their risk of bias to assessments and just to see if they're on the right lines and they're making the correct judgments. And quite often we, we do see, think, see this, where actually the description box is empty. Um, so not only is it a nightmare for us to look at, because uh, we can't tell if the right decisions have been made, um, but it's also not great for the authors either. Um, by the authors not completing these boxes, they've got no record of why they made the decisions that they made. Um, and this can create a huge problem when they want to resolve disagreements between authors or if someone challenges one of their judgments, they don't know why they've made the decision they have. Um, so as you can see here, they've put probably yes for every response. Um, and there's no descriptions to support any of these judgments. And um, there's only a sentence at the end saying some concerns with the randomization process. So the authors have no idea how they came to this decision. Um, so it means they're probably gonna have to go back to the paper or go back to the data extraction form and try and figure out uh, why they made the decision they did, which obviously adding time to an already time consuming process. Um, and I think as well, when you're not completing these, these uh, description boxes, you're more likely to make errors when you're doing the judgments. Um, it's quite easy to lose focus when you're doing them and just start clicking on their responses and not really thinking about the questions. Um, for example, this one has put probably yes for everything and it might be justified, but it might just be that they've just not really been reading the questions properly or just kind of getting into the click, click clicking mode and actually taking time to think about the assessment that they've made. So I think if you do just take some time write something in each box. It just helps you to go through the process and stops you making as many errors, hopefully, when you're doing it. And it doesn't have to be a long description in the box. It can just be a simple sentence, just explaining why you've made the decision you've made. Um, and even the nice, a nice quote from the paper can be helpful. Um, and just remember as well, to just keep saving these because it's quite easy to accidentally close the window down and potentially lose some of the, the judgments that you've put in. So the next one is um, about overriding the algorithm. So I'll use the same example that I used on the previous slide. Um, so when you're selecting the responses, um, the algorithm's used to come up with the overall risk of bias judgment per domain and then per the whole, the whole result at the end. Um, and Rachel showed you those nice colorful flow diagrams in the previous presentation, which is how the algorithm's kind of generated. So the general advice from us and hopefully from a lot of the, the Bristol team is to not override the algorithm. Um, I think it's important if you don't agree with what the result is at the end 
of per domain, that you're actually just go back to the sigma in questions and just have a look at what you've put and just ensure that you've actually selected the correct response and it matches um, the justification that you've given. Because it's, it's very easy to accidentally click the wrong one or to just misinterpret the, the sigma in question itself. Um, and then I think if authors really have a strong um, strong argument for overriding the algorithm, then you would need a very strong justification for this. And then you'd obviously need to apply it across the whole um, review to like, all the results. Um, and really, it also should be documented in the method section as a modification to the tool. So finally, I'll talk about authors assessing too many results. So this is something that happens a lot. Um, and it's something that could really save a lot of time if it's done, done correctly. So one of the requirements of the protocol is to list or refer to the results that will be assessed using risk advice to. Um, in reviews which have lots of comparisons and or outcomes, if the authors were to assess all, um, all of the results, then this would be a huge task and you'd have so many risk advice to results um, at the end of it. So a lot of authors um, decide to only do risk of bias two for their summary of findings table results. And in the protocol, it, it should specify which comparisons, which outcomes you're including in summary of findings tables. Um, and also it can be helpful as well to state which measures and which time points you're going to include as well, just to really kind of slim down the amount of uh, risk of bias two results you need to assess. Um, and this helps as well to really focus the summary Right, summary sections of the review, such as the abstract, um, which should be based on your summary of findings tables. Uh, so Rachel kindly let me use her example, which she talked about um, earlier, the mental health uh, first aid review. Um, so as you can see, uh, the authors on this review have um, risk of bias assessed all of the time points and outcomes in this one study. Um, so if they do the same approach for every study in the review, then that's going to be a lot of risk of bias to outcomes. And in the end, they actually only included some of, well, not yet, yeah, not many of these results in the actual review itself. So in the like in the end, a lot of the risk of bias to assessments were never presented in the review. So it's a lot of time kind of wasted on, on doing this process. And obviously the review itself takes such a long time. So you don't want to be adding even more time to, to the process. Um, so this emphasizes the importance of really planning your summary findings tables in the protocol and really planning what you're going to be doing your risk of bias to assessment on. So yeah, so that brings me to the end of the, the talk on the four common errors that we usually see. Um, but I've just put in some resources and further reading. I've put in a link to the Cochrane Handbook, which is uh, chapter eight of the current version. And that's really good um, if you're not as familiar with the tool or you just want to get a bit of a general overview of it. Um, and then there's a really useful page on the Cochrane Methods website, which has a lovely introduction to the tool. And it also has a starter pack, which is really good if you're just setting off with your protocol and you need some kind of help with how to use the tool and what to write in your protocol and in the review itself. And there's also some really good webinars which talk about each domain. Um, so definitely worth looking at them. And then, of course, there's the risk of bias uh, website itself from the Bristol team. And that's got all the detailed guidance and templates and, and also the Excel tool, which can be used to do the actual assessment. And I'll also draw your attention to a recently published paper in the BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine Journal. Uh, so this was published uh, last month. And this is from authors within Cochrane. And they're talking about um, using risk of bias too and comparing it with the old tool and just giving some tips um, on how to use it. So it's actually really a really good paper to read. Um, and the uh, Bristol team are also planning on doing some more papers uh, talking about um, each domain and giving more tips and guidance in each domain. So hopefully these will be available soon and we'll obviously make them available on the Cochrane Methods website when they are. Uh, so we invite people to contact us at the Method Support Unit, and here's um, the email. Um, this is Rachel's email. And uh, if you so, if you have any further questions after this webinar, then feel free to contact us. Uh, but we're happy to discuss any comments or questions from the audience. Thank you.